great to be here and to be asked to meet everyone, some familiar faces and new folk in the audience. So it's uh, lovely to be here and to meet you all. And what a fantastic presentation we've just heard. One of the lessons we've heard from uh, social role valorization is quite often things have to be structured to bring people into contact with each other. And I don't think I've heard a better presentation of how to structure those opportunities in what Lisa and Sean uh, have achieved through his life. And so we want to look at the contribution SRV has to these kind of ideas. Some of you would be very familiar with this because you've been to training and uh, so I want to offer you some things we don't often cover in that training. And for others of you that haven't attended that this will still make sense but might encourage you to try and find a two-day workshop somewhere and kind of get that coverage. And uh, because SRV is like a technology, it's a kind of how-to and when you want to build the good things of life, it shows you how to go about doing that. And um, so some of the things that we want to cover in this short time that we have together. Uh, one of the things we need to understand is, uh, is there a definition for roles? Because it's like the air we breathe and we take it for granted. We've all got roles in this room and we've acquired them with just a little bit of nudging, perhaps from others, you know, grandparents that said, you know, you're really good at that. And it kind of gives you an idea that, you know, maybe I'll pursue that, you know. And so we get these little nudges in certain directions. But for the people that we know and support, it may mean that we have to have a great deal more knowledge about how roles work if we're going to assist them to acquire these things and bring about the effects that we want. And you might say, well, why should roles be so important? And so we have this uh, empirical statement that uh, social role valorization is based on this connection between the roles you have and the life you end up leading. And it's like if you don't get the roles, you don't get the life. And so this being entirely descriptive here, you can see from this statement that this isn't a philosophy. Uh, this isn't like we want the world to operate this way. It's a description of the way the world does operate in a probabilistic nature. There might sometimes be some variables that enter where this doesn't take place. Prince Harry in Afghanistan fighting for the f allied forces there. Probably this isn't going to operate. It's not going to say, oh, he'll be protected by being a prince fighting the Taliban. No, that's not going to happen. You know, if they knew he was there, he'd be the biggest target possible. So there, his valued roles don't protect him at all. But back at home in England, well, they just fall over each other, loving this guy because of the valued roles that he has. And, and the kind of person he is in those valued roles as well. So this is a very important empirical kind of description here that if you really do want the good things of life, then you have to get valued social roles. And the opposite is also true. If you don't have many valued roles or the only roles you hold are devalued, they're negative roles, then you'll probably not get access to the good things of life. End of story. So it's kind of, if you want the good things of life for people, then here are the kind of roles that you'd need to, to kind of pursue. Now, I just want to spend a little bit of time on this idea of the good things of life. Uh, we tend to use that rather than the good life, because the good life in Western society has come to mean like shopping at Harvey Norman or, you know, living on the Riviera, kind of materialistic life. But in our description of the good life here, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the richness of life that everybody seeks. And it's interesting, everybody seeks it even across different cultures. People want to belong, they want to be loved, they want to be able to contribute, they want to grow and learn. They want to have a positive sense of identity. They want to have a kind of cosmic experience and a connection. And so these are things that everybody kind of seeks. They're, they're the ways that we most meet our needs. And most of these things are free. You just can't purchase them. And they come from other people as well. We kind of exchange the good things of life with each other. As Lisa says, they're reciprocal. It's a reciprocal arrangement. But you have to be valued for that to happen. People have to see you as being worthwhile enough to deserve the things that they have on offer, like friendship, like belonging, like getting a job and being a neighbour and being invited to parties. I'd, I'd never seen parties be so important. I have to have a, a real look at this. And, um, and positive connections to the police force and everything the parties bring and uh, that kind of nature. And, <laughs> and, uh, and hopefully neighbours as well. And uh, notice how much stronger this is than the idea of just seeking happiness. Happiness, happiness is not a very go good goal of life. I mean, we all kind of have to occasionally feel happy. You know, and it, it kind of pops up now and again. But for the most part, life is a struggle. 
it's hard work and sometimes it incorporates suffering. It can be hell. <laughs> you know, blooming hard, but you get better and you get stronger and you strive and you get character. Now that's worth working for rather than the notion of just be happy kind of idea. I'm just waiting kind of idea. Now if we set people up to expect happiness, imagine the disappointment they're going to experience. Right? When it doesn't happen, most of the time. It's kind of ordinary, average. How was your day? Oh. <laughs> kind of thing. And you move on. And if you don't have something to move on with, then how can you defeat the suffering? How can you embrace it even? And see life has meaning even in suffering. Now that's a whole, no you need another workshop on that kind of topic. Right? But at least to say that happiness is not a particularly powerful goal to head for. And it's interesting that goals are very important because they direct what we begin to look at. Because we can't take in everything. So what do we take in? We take in what we aim for. And if we have nothing to aim for, then we're aimless. And we don't want to be aimless in the lives of people that we know and support. We want to have some aim. And when you develop the idea that it's the good things of life, and as Lisa said, the relationships to her that were so much a feature of the important goal, then you start looking. You start seeing stuff. The world manifests itself in a way that matches what you're aiming for. But if you're not aiming for something that makes sense, or is utopian, or is a false dream, you won't see the things that you need to see in order to make the kind of changes. Because you can't take in everything. So I'll take in that that I'm aiming for. Then all sorts of opportunities start popping up and you seize them, a kind of serendipity. You don't know what's ahead. But when you're aiming for something, you see the opportunities and the possibilities that arise. And again, Lisa and Sean's story had tremendous, you know, these opportunities bursting before them because they were looking because that was what they were aiming for. So goals identify a future potential. It's like that vision. This is what we want. And something that hasn't happened yet, but it can with the right approach. And so it's the right approach that SRV brings us. It creates an impetus as well to sacrifice immediate things for a longer term future. There are lots of things that flow, come up on our scene right before our eyes but many of them are trivial and frivolous. It's the kind of culture we're in. We live in a culture of excess. You can have anything now. And, so, and, and you can have it immediately. And some of those things are very enticing, but they're not particularly good for us, whether financially, whether in terms of health and direction. And some of these things even become addictions for us. We become so involved with it, we now can't escape it. Even the advertising tends to reflect this have it now kind of idea. Nike, just do it. Jeep just says, don't hold back. Do it now. And it's like you can feed your basic motivations, your senses can be fed instantly. But those things don't take you anywhere. Eating at McDonald's is like, that's it? You realize then the future has many more possibilities. And sometimes it means the ability to be able to sacrifice and say no to the present in order to deliver the long-term benefit. But in our culture, we see people do the exact opposite. They, whoops, sorry, they trade off the long-term future for immediate gratification. And you would have heard of the gratification studies, the marshmallow test where the kids were offered a marshmallow and said, if you can keep that marshmallow there and not eat it until I come back, I'll give you another one. And then they just watch the kids on the video. It's hilarious. Go on YouTube and look for the marshmallow test. Hilarious. One little girl or boy, she he picks up the marshmallow and licks it, puts it back again, you know. <laughs> you just couldn't wait. Go get a little lick, you know, and kind of thing. One little girl's bawling her eyes out as she's eating her marshmallow. She knows she's blown it, right? That's it. One, and she's eating a marshmallow and she's crying her eyes out. It's just hilarious. But some of the kids could wait. And when they traced these kids through the rest of their life, it turned out that the more success they had, relationships, work, income, health, was the kids who could wait for the second marshmallow. So you realize the 
ma major ingredient of success is often self-control combined with its sister, a trait called conscientiousness. Can I be conscientious? So one of the issues here is the people that we support and know and love, we, can they too embrace the good things of life? Can they grab it with both hands and be willing to sacrifice sometimes when necessary the present for the future rather than sacrificing the future for the present? just to have my choice, to have my way, to be empowered, that kind of stuff that we hear all the time. The lovely thing about the good things of life is that it's achievable. In fact, all, many of you have a gratifying level of the good things of life. Let's have a look at some of them. It's a fairly big list, isn't it? And uh, some of you have done a little exercise where you get you to write down five of these. You know, what are the things you most want in life and get you to share it and you find that everyone pretty much wants the same kind of things. Now, how it plays out, like for you, what does this look like, uh, varies enormously. So this is, has a very individual reflection on it. Like some people do karate, other people go fishing, you know, so the different ways this plays out is enormously variable but you're still getting a sense of growth and learning and belonging and friendship, reciprocity, contribution. These are the things that really make life meaningful. But you have to put out effort. Not easy to get these things. You have to put out effort. And that's where the person that you're supporting, do they want these things? Is this a driving force? Right, so the earlier you get to taste this, right? notice too these things have to be given voluntarily. You can't demand these things from other people. I have a right to be loved and I want it now. It kind of doesn't work that way, does it? That's why rights don't bring the good things of life. Now there's a place for rights. The Rohingya need some rights. They need protection. But it's not everything. If you just got your rights, you'd have a very basic kind of life. If you want the good things of life, though, you need to be much more embedded with other people because that's where you get these from. As you bring these to other people, these things are reciprocal, they're voluntary, they can't be demanded. Hopefully they're not made into some law that I must be loved. <laughs> right? It would kind of change the nature of the love a bit. Notice you can't, can't really buy these things. Even the Beatles knew that. You can't buy me love. Because imagine if you have to buy love, it kind of changes the value of it a bit. You notice that? It kind of doesn't have the same ring to it. Yes, I get loved every Friday at two. It doesn't kind of... You want something that's a bit more constant, isn't it? So, um, so watch. These are all traps. Uh, these I, there's lots of ideas in our field you know, the empowerment and rights and their traps because they don't deliver anything like the good things of life. That's what, and that's probably what you're wanting. So these are very handy. Imagine a team of people being on the same page around this. Some of you are employing your own workers. Imagine if your workers understood that this is what you were after and could translate this into specific individual terms for your son and daughter and that they understood that every day they could measure their efforts towards the extent we've moved towards facilitating the good things of life. Because nothing like a team having the same purpose. It's what brings teams together. The number one thing that brings teams, there's lots of things that bring teams together. It's the number one is that they work to the same purpose. So that's why the, I'm hammering the good things of life a bit because it's just such a great direction to be heading into. And it's so consistent with what everybody wants from life. Some of you might have seen the recent series called Employable Me. You know, every one of those young people said, I just want to be treated like everybody else. Good things of life. I want a job. I want to look decent. I want to be treated decent. I want some friends. I want to belong. I want to be treated like everybody else. So this works best when people also are fired up themselves about these things. You might need to be the first one though, you know. It gets captured, there's a trigger. People get ignited and get pretty excited about this stuff but it speaks to our deepest needs and you'll hear people reflect that this is what they want. So some pointers then about how might we proceed 
with this as we go up to morning tea. It's always great being ahead of morning tea. People have a certain urgency in there and uh, <laughs> kind of helps the presenter. You're kind of saying, get on with it. And um, So the first one is, well, start as early as you can. I mean, different people stumble across this stuff at different portions of their life, but if you can start early in people's lives, like a birth, that's a good start with these ideas. And the, this is now much more available than it used to be, perhaps, and people could stumble along for decades sorting out what direction should we head into and get caught into segregated environments and very low expectations, very common for people to experience, and uh, reduced opportunity, and all of that creates new needs. Wolfensberger referred to those events as wounds that leave deep social and emotional and sometimes physical scars because the conditions of life were so appalling for people. And it can take ages to then recover and to heal, but the scar still remains. You don't want to go there. You want to start early and get the good things of life, laying the foundations for that as early as you can. Uh, my wife and I have had the pleasure of uh, being very involved in t with the lives of two of our youngest grandchildren who live not far from us. And uh, the eldest of the two girls also has Down syndrome. And so we've spent six years getting them both ready for school. We, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit more, but from a very early start, you know, the cutlery packer, the table setter, the egg collector, the pet owner, the team member, the churchgoer, the horse enthusiast, the dancer, the hiker, the camper, these kind of things are being built. And they have a world of experience uh, in these early roles and the expectations that go with it. Uh, I should have mentioned too that, that we have a def some definitions around a role, that a role is a socially expected pattern of behaviour, an obligation, it brings privileges and responsibilities. So there are boundaries around roles. Uh, some people step across a boundary and that they may lose their role. So roles are quite well defined. Uh, being a driver, you have to be, remain um, free of alcohol, you know, so you get over a certain limit, you could lose the right. There's a boundary around that. Parents are expected to actually look after their children and if they don't, even the state enters and uh, will remove those children. Not always in a beneficial way, but it's like you can't continue to do this and remain in the role. So there are conditions for meeting a role. Uh, some conditions are very tight, but other conditions are, are looser depending on what that role might be. Now, the second thing we might do is also to reflect what roles does the person already have and can we make their existing roles more positive? And you might say, well, what, how do you make that more positive? What makes a role more positive? You know, in a sense, the role continues to expand and grow bigger and larger and more fulfilling. And the best way of doing that is to help the role increase in its competence, in the independence that the role is performed in. Uh, it's not wrong to get help in a role. Uh, some roles are so complex that it takes time to acquire the skills for it or the conditions for it. So there might be a gradual increase in the number of elements it's contained. Like it's taken you know, more sometimes than 20 years for us to learn to become an adult. And for some people they need even longer kind of thing. You know? And uh, so there are lots of elements to being an adult, a man and a woman, these kind of things, and you build them up over time and you become more competent and independent in it. And then you become a husband and you give up on all of that. And, um, you know, so you want to build up as many role elements as you can. And uh, when that happens, the role gets larger and what's interesting, it also tends to get more valued. When it gets more valued, then people admire the person who holds the role. That is, the value of a role is conferred to the person. And the whole basis of SRV is that we tend, if the role is valued, we tend then to accord that value to the person who holds the role. And Stephen Hawkins was mentioned earlier. And of course we see a wonderful example of a man who simply had, was so competent in one area that was accorded all the value of a very highly valued person in spite of all the qualities about him that would normally have just put him in some nursing home in a back ward and would have been dead years ago had it not been for those competencies that were so highly valued and those roles that people fought to maintain and keep him in. 
So you see then why value is more important than power. Can you, can you see how Trump, like how well treated he is because he's the most powerful man in the world? No. <laughs> Probably most despised man in the world. It's not power that makes the difference, it's value. A baby's the most powerless person. Newborn baby, no power, but so valued. The people even lose sleep <laughs> for this baby, right? That's the value that makes the difference. Don't go after power. I'm powerful. I'll get the good life. You don't get the good things of life because you're powerful. It's because you're valued. You're wanted. It's how to make unwanted people wanted. And Lisa and Sean were a brilliant example of that. And... Uh, so we want to help people increase these valued roles, get stronger in it, make it more valued. It has a fabulous impact when people get to do more for themselves. A further thing is that we think, well, skills are needed for many roles. The more competent you are, the more roles become available to you. So competency is important, but what we're commenting on here is that competency doesn't mean, doesn't mean you can do the task, it also incorporates the habits and disciplines associated with learning and with maintaining that skill. I mean, lots of teenagers know how to brush their teeth, but do they? Right? You've got to work on it. You know, sometimes have to say, when you put your pajamas on, you've got to brush your teeth. You know, you're trying to pair it because you go to bed without doing it. And then he ends up with a rotten... It's not that he can't do it, but he won't kind of problem. So competencies here are used as a wider kind of concept that you've got to practice. You've got to be willing to put in the effort, make those sacrifices if you're going to be successful at this. And that's easier when you're learning something you love. It's easier to learn things you love than things you don't. They're tedious. They're laborious. You'll get out of it at every chance you can. But when you love something, it's so much easier to learn it and get good at it, even masterful at it and work at it for hours and hours and hours and love doing that. And time feels like it goes fast. That's interesting, isn't it? So some of the things that this involves is finding out what it is that people love and pairing that to some role prospects for people. And um, it's a very important aspect, this, this uh, aspect of incorporating the discipline that's needed. Notice that, you know, if we just adopt the choice idea, we'll just go with anything you want to do. It's your choice, which is another mantra. It's another little sand trap there. Then, of course, you'll have people say, well, I'd just like to stay home and watch TV. Well, who wouldn't? But if you want the good things of life, you know that that would be devastating. And so we've seen people end up going into a service and someone in the house said, you don't have to go to work if you don't want to. Oh, and the parent will say, it's just undone 25 years of my teaching in half an hour by the nonsense of this service. And we've seen many examples of that. And I'm not exaggerating this. Where complete life it becomes wasted. Nothing worse than a wasted life. And uh, to encourage people to do that, it's just dreadful. So let's move on. Capitalise then on... Uh, the contribution roles foster and to the idea of being able to contribute to other people. And again, uh, many examples in Sean's story of these cooperative ventures of helping and contributing. Uh, some literature has suggested of all the good things of life, this one might be one of the strongest in terms of its impact on people. After all, it's more blessed to give than to receive. We love being able to support and reach out and be needed by other people. Whereas many people in services are just on the receiving end. They're recipients. Nothing is expected back from them. In fact, there might be policies that prohibit a gift or a card ever being received from a service recipient. We don't want anything from you. you know how dreadful that is to place people in a circumstance where they're not to contribute anything. And you don't want that for your sons and daughters and people you support. 
So it adds a real sense of belonging because reciprocity sustains and builds closeness between people. It's give and take. Every relationship has to be based on reciprocity. And if it's not, it probably won't last long. It's an absolutely fundamental feature of it. And so people who can't or are unwilling to reciprocate face substantial barriers in being valued by other people. So is there something that gets the person excited? Sure, they can get habits to empty the dishwasher and brush their teeth, but we also need some roles that enlarge who we are. And so we want to look for what has been referred to as the triggers, the external events or people, experiences that pop up unexpectedly that make us realize this is it, this is what I want, this is who I want to be. And they show us who they really wish to become. Very interesting effects on this too, that once you realize this, you know where you belong. It's almost like, I know my community, this is who the, I am. And you hear stories of this. There's a, a young Aboriginal opera singer who realized that she wanted to be on stage when she heard, um, oh, what was her name? Who, who's the opera singer that used to be uh, um, Dame... Uh, that's her. Um, <laughs> and, uh, she was in, and she can say, I was in row wide, seat 25 on this date. Like it's one of those moments you realize, that's it. And she says, I wanted to be up there. And, then, and of course now she has indeed performed up there. So that's a trigger and the person becomes ignited. Triggers are external, ignition is internal and it fires people up. And that means you guys get to become like coaches. Didn't you say you wanted to be and you give people feedback about that? Didn't you say you want to be treated as an adult? I don't think that's working for you today. Do you want to look in the cupboard and see if we can see if something matches? Like you give feedback? Now you don't have to be Mick Malthouse at half time if you've ever seen him go off at the team. It's a bit crazy. You don't have to be that direct. But people need feedback. If they don't get it, they'll be walking into mistakes they couldn't foresee because we didn't tell them and it'll undermine their efforts. And uh, Because these things indicate a sense of, it helps define their true self. This is like this vision. It's a fantasy, fantasy in the sense that it hasn't happened yet. It's not fantasy in the sense that it can't. It's just that it's not yet. It's like, That's where I belong. That's who I am. So it helps to find their true self, their moral self, the sense of who it is they want to become. So from this, you get to discover what talents and gifts that are there in order to engage and enlarge and to refine what the person is trying to become. Who are they? So some passions can drive roles forward into areas that no one ever imagined. Like we're hearing of people going to university and it's their passion for things that is driving that. But you have to be observant. And we're back to that looking aspect. And so knowing what you're after helps you be watchful for opportunities that might burst right before your very eyes. But if you're not looking, you fail to realize that potential. Some of the studies about people who think they're lucky from those who don't have been fascinating because in one study they laid down $50 notes across the ground and thought, you know, of this group who will find them. But unlucky people just say, I'm never lucky luck never happens for me. So they're not looking. The lucky people kind of, they know stuff pops up all the time and they find all the $50 notes because they're just on the ground. It's what you're looking for and not being aimless. So this attribute of seeing things that pop up, we call serendipity. It's like things in the moment, ah, an opportunity. And some of you will know support workers who have this ability to seize an opportunity in that moment. Oh, that's a great asset. That's a great talent in a worker, rather than, you know, moseying along. And we went into the community on my phone, you know, where nothing happens. And uh, so it's a really uh, important attribute. So once you take aim, the world will manifest itself according to your aim. And this is why the good things of life offers a wonderful and valid direction. But we have to discover what the good things of life look like for this person. Because each of us have a different take on the good things of life. What that looks like for each of us. There's an individual answer. 
So when both of you see the goal, others surrounding the person become like that coaching team and give that kind of feedback, that necessary feedback that I've mentioned. So be aware that if people lack roles, they may become role famished. They're hungry, they're starving for roles. And therefore they're desperate for any role, even if it's negative. You have to be something. And when people have few roles, it leaves them in a terrible psychological position of possibly pursuing the role that feels easiest and closest, but often is negative. So a teenager who has few roles might become a graffiti artist, a binge drinker, you know, a hoon driver, pregnant, and in some communities a terrorist because I can grab that overnight. To get a positive role, you might have to work for five years to get that, you know, be good at tennis, dancing, swimming, mathematics. That's five years, 10,000 hours. I can't wait, I need something now. So the caution here for us, again, is around this choice, is just not to go with whatever people want to do in this desperate case. If people descend into a negative role, the eternal child, the menace, the alcoholic, the porn addict, may take you the rest of your life to get out of that role. Those roles tend to capture people. So rather than choice being freedom, it's bondage. That's not the freedom we thought would come from choice. So you've got to be careful about what you encourage here. You don't want people to enter those, those negative roles. It's being valued that brings the good things of life, not learning how to throw your weight around by being empowered. Whew. Step on that button. So know the difference between something that's consistent with the good things of life and what isn't. And you're having to be diligent about that. It's just not like doing anything you want. And uh, keep in mind the potential for drifting into these easily obtained negative roles, as we mentioned earlier, or for service practices that can undo years of effort and hard work. So discern what interests should be supported and what should be avoided. We have a culture of excess with instantaneous access. Devastating set of circumstances when people lack self-control. Rather than choice, it's just obedience to basic impulses and desires. That's not even choice, it's just obedience. It's not usually ones associated with the good things of life. Therefore, think roles, not activities. Many parents will be concerned when they leave school, what will they do? And they want to draw up a sense, well, Tuesday will be bowling and Thursday will be dancing and then there's art on, you know, and we'll do cooking at TAFE and we'll have a nice full schedule of activities. And I've been back to see people 20 years later and they're still just doing the same thing, but they haven't become anything. So the, em the emphasis rather than wasn't on roles, it was on activities, on a schedule. That's a, the that's a wrong... Now, it's a subtle difference because roles incorporate doing something. There are activities in roles, but devoid of everything else the role contains. Whereas when you think about a role, you become something. You're not just doing cooking, you become the cook. You're not just doing art, you become the artist. And you realise this is a fuller experience. I've got to look the part... I've got to develop the habits and disciplines of what this involves and dedicate myself to it, not just turn up for TAFE. I'm not having a crack at TAFE, by the way. Although it is strange to learn cooking at TAFE in circumstances where parents won't let their son and daughter in the kitchen at home. Right? You learn the skill where the skill gets used. There's a whole lot more, <laughs> much more advantage to it. So... Well, let's go back. Think typical. Now, Lisa referred to this as that ordinary life. And in thinking typical, valued roles are done in culturally appropriate ways. So you have to know how these roles operate within your culture. There's a culture and age-appropriate aspect to what it is you're doing. 
So think typical about this. So it's not what service is available, nor what money is needed. Make the support facilitate a life, not the support become the life. So get your life, the life you want clear for people. The money is the last question, not the first. So let's have a look here at an example of a family that allow me to use this. This is Andrew. Now when Andrew left school, the family looked at what the other students leaving school were doing. And many of them were having a gap year and going overseas. And they thought, well, well, we'll just let Andrew go overseas for a year. And they thought, hmm, maybe not. So what they did, they rented a three-bedroom house and found a flatmate, but then online invited people from overseas to come and live with Andrew, as long as that they, they stay for three months. So there's the flatmate. It's a nice flatmate. And so now Andrew has people who come into his life. What's interesting, Andrew's speech is quite slow. If you say, Andrew, what's that? You say, that, that's a glass, which is perfect for the people learning English. None of these people can speak English. So they're linguistically equivalent. And so they stay for three months. Uh, by the way, Andrew's learned to cook since leaving home. He just loves cooking all these overseas kind of dishes and so on that he's picked up. Uh, just look how typical Andrew's life is in the garden with Claire mucking about, doing yoga. Uh, quite often I go into services. I have a job where I get to evaluate some agencies and uh, I walk in and I say, could I swap with these people? Is this so typical of ordinary life that I could say, yeah, you go home and I'll, I'll, I'll swap. This is so attractive. And when I look at Andrew's life, I think, yeah, I could swap with Andrew. <laughs> now, I'm not saying you all have to go off and do houses and invite overseas travellers. This is their thing. And uh, the tour guide. So now he's a tour guide across New Zealand for these people visiting. People he runs into, and he's a very accomplished artist in the open scene. There's not in disability art, but and he runs his own exhibitions, and he has his own mentor. That man has uh, become too frail now, and so they called for other artistic mentors. Six people wanted to be his mentor. You know, can I? Can I? And because uh, he conducts his own beautiful look at the art behind them. It's uh, and so he's in a compendium of artists of New Zealand. Not disabled artists, regular artists. He, Andrew is in there. So let's go back to our little list. And uh, Now this next piece is that you also have to look the part. Not only what to do, that competency, you have to have the image associated with the role as well. And, um, and that means too that uh, you look better. In a valued role there are usually expectations about appearance. And of course that gives a psychological lift. You know, we go to the hairdresser and we feel better. Well, as a result of, you know, looking a little bit better, it gives you that kind of look. So you have to look at the age and behave the age. And so the images, in a sense, create the expectations from other people because you look like you're in the role and therefore treat you as though you are and therefore you begin to perform in accordance to the role expectation that is given. A uh, picture of our two little girls we've been getting ready for school. You're supposed to go, oh... <laughs> and they are as gorgeous as they look. They are just delightful kids. And now they're already in the roles around the homemaker roles, the wash up. I love seeing these kids have fun washing up. It's amazing because that doesn't happen when they're 16. Something <laughs> happens. And uh, so it's just great making pizzas and porridge and pancakes and kneading bread and picking vegetables and collecting eggs and feeding chickens and learning to play the glockenspiel and the ukulele and being a dancer and a swimmer and a camper and a hiker and... And they're only, well, Olivia on the right is only four. Kess has just gone to school. She's had her first year at school. She's in a little school that has primary and secondary on the one campus. She's the first child with Down syndrome to go to this school ever. And her, uh, her prep teacher has a sister with Down syndrome, like in very positive relationship. And everyone in the school seems to know Kess when she walks in. Everybody wants to say hi to Kess. And there are quite a few hugs. And on the way out, now this is right up to year 12. So she's here greeting year 12 kids, as well as all the other littlies. And I'm not sure what it is that uh, 
attracts people to her, but she is, she's very attractive. And that's common for little kids. It gets a bit harder as people get older. The cuteness kind of goes off a bit. And uh, we have to know that the relationships have already been built and can withstand that. So and th now this is a really handy point I want to emphasize. When people are going into new circumstances, set up the cues for them in advance. That is, you have to go in in advance. Say, what does a person need to know to succeed here? And have we made that available? I see people wander into new environments and the staff provide no cues and often something terrible happens and they're banned from this in ever going back there. We're seeing people being banned from footy clubs and RSLs because no one has helped establish how to behave. For instance, a young man might be at his first day on work experience and there's a food van at morning tea and he runs to the head of the queue. You need people in the queue to say, hey mate, come back and stand next to me and wait your turn. From day one, don't do this gradual thing, oh he'll get into it. No he doesn't. If you let that go on day one, you've kind of had it. That's his habit now and you won't get him out of that easily. So establish the pattern right from the outset. and. Uh, so use the power of new circumstances. And as we've already said, these roles help participation. Without roles, there's no participation. You're just an observer. So it help you to do that. And that means then that the role is stronger than an impairment in shaping the mind of an observer. When a person's in a valued role, people don't see the impairment primarily. They see the role. They may see a person might have, for instance, Down syndrome, but that is no longer a negative feature. The role speaks louder than the impairment. Because we're trying to change the minds of other people here as well, but not through lecturing and badgering and threatening, do it or we'll sue you. We want them to do this naturally and that's what roles bring. It's an antidote for being devalued. Be without a valued role, all we see is impairment. It's what we've got to change. Now, final point. Ugh. Might need new batteries in. Be careful about ascribing a role to a person who can't perform it. Some roles are competency based. So you set up a business and you manufacture things and you sell them. And say the person isn't able to do any of that, but we say, oh, she's the entrepreneur and she makes these things and, so, and she's not able to do any of that. So if you're going to have a role, you have to be able to at least do something in it. Very important feature because you don't want to send a message to the observer that's essentially false. You know, the emperor has no clothes. You want them to believe something that's not true, that's disastrous, not only for the person but maybe for the efforts of other people as well. So sometimes we start with inspiration Something we too are triggered that ignites us. But for real success, you, have, you can't be based on inspiration alone. You have to know what to do. And so we wanted to give you some kind of technical clues here that might be useful for you. Unfortunately, our context and service system is filled with a lot of rhetoric. You might have noticed that. And pronouncements that reflect the wish of how things should be rather than how they are. We've seen that in the banks of late. It's wonderful that Wales ad, isn't it? While this bank inquiry is occurring and they're showing us how they're looking out for us, it's just great. It's just <laughs> if you're going to be at all successful, it'd be because you haven't swallowed false ideas. But use ideas that are concordant with reality and how humans actually function and how things have always been. That is, you don't embrace false hopes and utopian dreams. What you will face sometimes is disappointment, constant setbacks, system failures and dysfunctionalities at every level, even in ourselves. People will disappoint us and sometimes they will amaze us. If the system works at all though, it's probably only for a short time. And then it gets worse again. Have you noticed that? You know? <laughs> Reforms will likely introduce a new set of perversions. And that is precisely the context any leader or change agent has to come to grips with. Dysfunctionality is just a part of the human condition. Things will probably get worse. It's called entropy. It winds down. It decays. Now Wolfensberger has a whole seven day workshop on this topic, so I'm not expecting you to actually believe any of that, but, but if you're interested in it, that's the workshop you need to go to. How do you obtain moral coherency in a world that's fallen apart? It's kind of what it's called. 
very interesting event. So what must I do that will still be effective in a context of such dysfunctionality? So it's in such circumstances that perhaps our best inventiveness and innovation is often born. Not because we're so comfortable and privileged, but because we're placed into difficulty, sometimes despair, and as I've mentioned, suffering. It would seem now that the NDIS is going to provide us the perfect conditions for such growth and development. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Lovely being with you.